Everyone was forced to bend the knee to the wheel, and everybody will be forced to bend the knee to Bitcoin. With the Bitcoin, you are actually protecting your labor. And they come knock on your door, and they're like, we're going to take this Bitcoin, or we're going to you know, arrest you and imprison you. In the end, they can only take it from you if you give it to them. That's never existed before. Bitcoin becomes the end-all, be-all money at some point. If I can control your money, then you're always going to have to obey me and follow what I want. But if I take away those shackles and give you the freedom to control your life and control your financial reward. Let's start with a small introduction of, of, of you guys. I'm Trey. Um, <clears throat> I came up small town, South Carolina, mm -hmm. got into Bitcoin. Um, after I entered the IT world in the civilian world, I was in the Marine Corps for a little while. But once I once I got in the civilian world, I entered the IT field. And sometime around 2017 ish, I got in, interested in Bitcoin. Um, I bought some and then sold it. I made like 30 bucks. I think I bought like $300 worth at the time. I had no idea what I was doing. I was buying, I started buying other cryptos between 2017 and 2020 uh, on and off. Like I had periods of time where I would buy a lot of crypto and then I wouldn't do anything for months. And then I'd come back to it. My interest kind of came and went, but then sometime around 2020, 2021, I had like my Bitcoin epiphany moment. And just went down the rabbit hole from there. Ended up uh, working in crypto, um, not Bitcoin specifically for a while, and learned a lot about crypto and kind of some of what that looks like. Realized that I didn't really like that and moved into Bitcoin specifically. And we do a little Bitcoin mining. Uh, we do, we help people with like Bitcoin point of sale stuff uh, from time to time. And uh, yeah, that's me. Amazing. And, and, Before we get to to Tom, um, what made you understand Bitcoin? Like I'm um, always like interested. It, it seems like that uh, when you have Bitcoin and you have crypto, and like first you get a little into it because number go up technology, then you get into the other uh, cryptos, and then you start slowly, slowly to actually understand Bitcoin. Like what made you understand it, and like what made you what made it click for you? Well. At first, the kind of the first inkling that I had that something was different about Bitcoin was when I read a Bitcoin, I read a book called the Bit the Promise of Bitcoin or the Bitcoin Promise. I can't remember. It was the first Bitcoin book I read, and that one kind of laid the framework for why why Bitcoin was different and kind of how the author had seen different people come and go in Bitcoin and why they were always wrong, how they should have always stayed, they shouldn't have sold their Bitcoin, they shouldn't have taken profits, so on and so forth. And that one kind of opened the door. But what really got me was when I started working in crypto and I saw behind the, the behind the scenes of crypto and what goes on, not necessarily in like a negative light, but just what goes on behind the doors. And realistically, I kind of classify all cryptocurrencies to include Bitcoin into one of three categories. Either it's it's a business trying to solve a problem that isn't money. Right. It's not, they might be trying to make money, but they're not trying to solve the money problem. So they're trying to solve a smaller problem that's driven towards profit one way or another. Everybody's in it just for the profit. And eventually they'll take profits and go back to the dollar. Uh, or it's a scam or it's Bitcoin and it's trying to solve the biggest problem. Therefore, everything else is a business or a scam. But Bitcoin is is completely separate and different. It's, it's actually just money and it's trying to solve a problem that it's very difficult to even see. Whereas everybody else is trying to solve something like a, like a, um, like a business related problem, whatever that may be, uh, you know, like an alternative currency, because you think you have a better currency, isn't a business problem, but for the most part, people are in that currency to make dollars, not to replace currency or be something different. So once I kind of figured that out, it became Bitcoin's important, but how important, what can it actually do? And I just kind of fell down that rabbit hole. And really, when I really got orange build was when I was on a long drive one day and I read the Bitcoin standard or listened to the Bitcoin standard. Once that happened, uh, everything else was just like super fast. Like I, I was almost completely converted. Um, I, I had this idea that one day I'd become like the, the Southern Baptist revival preacher of the South for Bitcoin. We'd have like this great Bitcoin revival, but I couldn't figure out how to phrase it because it's not a revival. It's an introduction. So I didn't want to be like, oh, we're going to do the great Bitcoin, the great Southern Bitcoin introduction. You know, it's like growing up in the South, I'm used to like big preaching events and big, big religious, you know, gatherings from time to time in small towns. 
And I kind of felt like Bitcoin was in the same category, but you can't present it re religiously. But I kind of had that idea that one day I would, I'd, uh, I'd run the South in Bitcoin. That's uh, that's interesting, and and I see a lot uh, the connection between religion and, and and Bitcoin. It's it's fascinating for me. But before we get into more topics, uh, Tom, please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm a tax accountant, prepare a tax return, provide um, monthly bookkeeping and payroll. In fact, that's how I met Trey. Uh, he's a client of mine for tax preparation. And I became attracted to Bitcoin when Trey began to explain to me the cost of the point of sales. And of course, with a lot of my small business clients, they're dealing with the escalating credit card charges and the fees from uh, different credit cards or PayPal or what have you. And so I became attracted to the to the whole process there that this would be a way for small business to do business and to keep their costs down. And also by the fact that Bitcoin is really true money, uh, of course, as we all know that as it goes up, your value goes up in, in your account as opposed to when you look at when you put money in the bank, um, depending upon what's going on with inflation, that $100 tomorrow could be $99 or it could be $95. Whereas with Bitcoin, that $100 the next day, of course, it could go the opposite way, go down. But right now, of course, it's going up. That $100 could turn into $103, $110. So I saw Bitcoin as a means for small business to really to level the playing field and also to protect the value of the service that they provide. And this is a big one, like the, the laying the play, uh, uh, leveling the playing field is like the, the one of the biggest things in, in, in Bitcoin because it gives like a fair chance and fair rules to, to everybody. And I, I love that aspect so much. Um, before we get more into Bitcoin, like how did uh, your podcast actually came together? It's it's really interesting. Also, the name Bitcoin is dead uh, uh, yeah. because we have like this website. Also, probably you're aware of like how how many times Bitcoin is is, is declared dead in in the mainstream uh, media. How did this name come come together? So I'm I'm glad you asked because I've been waiting on somebody to ask because I wanted to say this next phrase. Um, so this one time I was dressed up like George Washington behind a bowling alley. And um, what I was trying to do was there's a gun store nearby this bowling alley. And we were hosting an event where we wanted to bring together the Second Amendment gun community with the Bitcoin community, because I think there's a lot of there's a lot of overlap there. Uh, our goal was to try to bring Bitcoiners into the gun store and the gun store is also at the same time hosting their uh, their grand opening. So it was a combo effort for me to say, hey, like Bitcoin's a thing, you should pay attention to it. And this gun store is accepting Bitcoin as well as just being pro Bitcoin overall, right? Like they, they're here, we're here to preach each other's message together. And so I dressed up like George Washington to uh, attract the attention of passerbys. So like if you're driving down the road and there's a guy dressed like George Washington, you know, with the hat and the shoes, the coat, the whole nine holding up various Bitcoin signs and things like that, you might notice that and pay attention to it. So Leading up to this, I would dress up in that same outfit and go into different towns and just walk into businesses and offer, tell businesses like, hey, come see us on this day. We'll help you understand what a Bitcoin point of sale is, uh, how it works. And we're going to do some transactions, you know, live right there in front of everybody so you can see it. And I walked into a coffee shop in a small town near me called Graham. And there was an older gentleman at the cash register. And I'm dressed up like George Washington. So I, I look like a, you know, a pretty big maniac. And I walk up to the lady behind the counter, kind of explain what's going on. And she's interested and she's open and she's friendly. And then the guy, the older guy who was standing on the other side of the counter looks at me and says, you know, Bitcoin is dead. They, they, they arrested that Sam Bankman freed guy. So the government's already canceled Bitcoin. I don't know what you're doing. And he's an older gentleman, you know, like he's probably in his sixties or seventies. He didn't understand. And I tried to explain to him. And the only thing he really kept saying was a paraphrase of some, some phrase like Bitcoin is dead. And when it came time for me, me and Tom, we do a radio show every once in a while on the golden oldie station uh, in my local town. So it's a lot of times like I'll be talking about Bitcoin and somebody will call in uh, because they want to like they want to try to sell off an antique furniture piece that they have or something like that. Like it's there's a very big disconnect between Bitcoin and the golden oldies community when you talk about like people who listen to music from the 1940s, 50s, something like that. Um, but 
it was my first, uh, it was the first place that allowed me to come and talk. And so me and Tom have been doing that. He does it for the, the tax. You're the doing tax the tax side, season kind of when people have questions about the taxes and of course, with the ever changing tax laws. And, but I, I keep running into this thing, no matter where I speak. Cause I, I spoke with a, with, um, one of the Austrian groups here in my area, like in the Southern region, I spoke with them twice and kind of the same thing I run into is either gold is better. Bitcoin is dead or the government's going to shut it down and it will be dead. And so I just decided that if everybody keeps telling me Bitcoin is dead, that seems like a popular phrase. I'll pick that up. And so it, here we are. It is a popular phrase and it's, it, it seems like, and I feel like most of it is just because, uh, the heavy up and downs, because like once you get into Bitcoin or like once you see Bitcoin, you're like, oh, what is this? I don't believe it, but the government will shut it down. Then it goes up like crazy and you're like, oh, what's that? Uh, then it goes down like crazy. You're like, okay, it was just volatile. It is dead now. Then the second time it goes up, then you're like, okay, let's let's investigate a little further. Then it goes down and you're like, okay, it actually now it's dead. And then it goes up again and you're like, oh shit, this, this, still, this, this thing is still alive. Uh, yeah. So it's 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 probably just because the like the the price is, is is falling down but it's it's fascinating how much this phrase is still used uh even though this thing lives now for 15 years is getting stronger every year when you look at mining hash rate when you look at other stuff not just the price because the price is the least interesting thing in bitcoin uh, in my opinion but it's important to get new users in uh, i'm aware of that but let's talk about that um uh, mainstream and 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 social media thing a little bit um do, do you do you both still like uh read like newspapers and and, and the, let's let's call it traditional news versus uh the new news with like podcasting with twitter with with other stuff uh, are you still using like uh, traditional media I do some, I, um, when you made that comment, I, uh, it took me back a few years. I used to work in a newsstand back in the eighties when I was in college. And, um, and of course, uh, love to read the different magazines. In fact, Sunday was my favorite day to work because you had the New York times, hit the Washington post, you had the Atlanta journal. And of course here in North Carolina, the Raleigh paper, the Charlotte paper. And I would try to read as many of those papers as I could in that four to five hour shift there that I worked. Um, but over the last five to six years, um, uh, with the availability of the internet on your telephone, what have you, um, I can't remember the last time I read a newspaper uh, because of course with the telephone, it makes everything so much more convenient there. You know, boom. You just tap, tap, tap. And then you've got whatever you want to read. And I say that's more of a reflection of what's taking place. Um, I got grandkids and they're anywhere from 16 to seven. So of course their whole world is on the telephone. And that's the other thing that attracted me about the whole Bitcoin concept is very, very convenient. And of course, older people are going to be somewhat more resistant. I remember when you had the old dial up telephone years and years ago, but of course now, again, going back to my grandkids, they wouldn't know how to use a dial up telephone, even though it has a dial on it. They would be like what is this but you give them a cell phone and so of course that's the other thing again about the whole bitcoin concept is it's so convenient it's there on your telephone and as we all know as long as the internet's there the bitcoin is going to be there and of course everybody has their own prediction about the future of Bitcoin, what's going to take place, you know, what future will it, what will it role will it have in the future? And the fact of it is, as long as people have cell phone and have internet, Bitcoin is going to be here. Dom, I'm really interested in, uh, because you have said you have grandkids, you're probably then over 60 years old. Slightly, Slightly. 63. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm amazed because like, uh, young people that are like 25, 30, maybe like 35, 40, around that uh, that age, they usually get the digital thing faster. They, they get the digital thing quicker because they used it in like video games with skins. Like if you ask like a 15 year old, uh, if something digital has value there, of course, because I, I, I buy my skins of video games and stuff like that. And what I often encounter is with, with people like over 50, 55 is like the, 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 the limit that I see, um, they often understand better why gold has value. They often understand better the Austrian economics and uh, this kind of a thing better. 
but they have the the digital uh, digital um, let's see digital hurdle to to get over. Um, how do you how did you came over this, and, and was it also for you like the the Austrian economics and 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 gold value proposition was was faster there than the digital thing? It was a combination of all of the above. Uh, of course, in the field I'm in, in the world of accounting, everything is done now by the internet. Everything is done digitally there. Uh, I can remember um, in the 80s when I first got in the field of taxation, uh, you had to do it with the old paper. You had to use the pencil. And, of course, you had to have the carbon. And so, of course, I've seen that whole evolution going from doing it by hand to where now you, you type it in. And, of course, uh, old habits die hard. And a lot of it for me was, again, by the fact that I'm in the world of technology, I had to learn to adapt. I remember having a conversation with someone at a tax agency uh, back in the 90s, and I think I just got my email account. And anyway, I was telling her, I said, well, I don't have my email account set up completely. And she made the comment to me. She said, if you want to do business with us, you got to have email. So I begin to realize, okay, it's no longer to think that the internet's not going to survive. It's no longer, no need to think the email is not going to survive. In fact, I remember when the fax machine first came out and I can remember people saying, oh, it's not going to work. Oh, it's not going to last, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know, here we are, what, 40 years later and the fax machine is still around. Not as much though, of course, with the technology and the email and the scanning. So it made me really adapt to the technology and then i have of course having grandkids i got children and i just look uh especially at that 20 ish there which is my daughter's age her life is on her cell phone everything there so i begin to realize okay if you want to stay in the game you need to change your strategy and learn to use the tools that are available and of course trade's been a big asset to helping me with the whole internet and uh and again I guess you could say really giving me a higher level of confidence in taking away the fear. I think fear holds people back when you talk about the Internet and the email and what have you. And, of course, once you overcome that fear, you're like, hey, you know, this is pretty convenient. Well, and it is it for is me. Imagine imagine if like talking about how like the Internet or Bitcoin or whatnot might die. Imagine you had like a 15 year old kid and you introduced them for the first time to like your cousin you know, or like to your uncle or somebody. And you were like, Hey, this is my son, Tommy, he's 15. And then your cousin was like, well, he might not make it to 16. I'm not going to put much effort into that kid. He might die sometime soon. Like that's, that's like what I hear when people tell me like Bitcoin's going to die. It's like, at what point, if it was 30, would you be like, well, it's getting close to middle age. I reckon it might be around like, no, like, like this is a thing that's going to exist because we know how to create it. If you, if you outlawed V8 engines, V8 engines wouldn't go away because people still know how to use and make them you just wouldn't be able to necessarily buy new ones. But the, the concept that we know how to make them, we know how engines work. We, it'll, that, that idea doesn't die. And that's the same thing with Bitcoin. Like you can kill it in a region. You can stop your citizenry from using it. You can do all kinds of things to your people, but you can't actually stop the Bitcoin process itself unless you can collectively control most of the world's resources, either through energy or internet. So, I mean, like it's, it's a very difficult thing to kill. And so I don't really understand people's perspective on that a lot. It, it, it seems I think a lot of it me. is fear. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's fear, and then also, then once you accept that Bitcoin is going to be here, then you also got to realize, okay, even though I've been programmed to believe and think of gold, silver, diamonds, what have you, U.S. dollar, Mexican peso, what have you, there, the British pound, then you have to change the way you look at money, and that's the other thing that Bitcoin has made me do is made me change the way I look at money, and also do a lot more research. Because once you begin to research, you begin to realize, well, wait a minute, the U.S. dollar. It's basically almost worthless now. It's gone from the value that it had 1913, 1914, what have you, um, maybe one or two cents now. So that clearly tells you and explains to you what happens when you have um, – corrupt players in the game to what they would do to currency. And if you look at the history of currency, you begin to realize where well, you always got somebody behind the scene, like in the Wizard of Oz, the man behind the curtains. You always got somebody that is doing something to manipulate the value of that currency, not for the everyday working people, but for their own selfish gains. 
I, I love it so much uh, what you just said because um, especially what what Trey also said with the idea, even if Bitcoin the the vehicle dies off at some point, maybe like there's a bug, maybe there's some black swan that we don't know about. I put it at a zero 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 point one uh, possibilities, but uh, still, if it happens, the idea of sound money, the idea of digital scarcity is still there. And this is something where like more and more people, uh, more and more Bitcoiners are coming together. They're meeting in Bitcoin conferences. They're meeting in local meetups. This idea of sound money in the digital world is now on the table, is now here, and it will not go away. Even if Bitcoin goes away, which I don't think it will, but even if this goes away, it's just a matter of time till we figure out oh, why did Bitcoin die? Let's figure something out. How does it? How does it not uh, die? So it will be will be re- very interesting to see a future where where this is, is going. And I think uh, as, as as your uh, podcast is, uh, I think not that <laughs> I don't, don't think that Bitcoin will ever die. Uh, but which is also interesting um, uh, when when you Tom you you lived through the the internet thing and you made also this comparison with um, uh, the the fat around uh, the internet thing where like oh the internet will not be around the fax machine will not be around. Um, is it similar now to Bitcoin? Like, do do you see the 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 lines in the newsletters, the, uh, newspapers, uh, the lines in in, in uh, media outlets? Is is this like really compared? Because I see, there's this one really popular meme in Bitcoin, uh, where it's like internet m- might be just a fad passing by, something like that. Uh, New York Times um, probably made it. Uh, I don't remember it, uh, exactly, but something like that. And we have the same thing with with Bitcoin. Uh, and everybody underestimated internet, everybody underestimated Bitcoin, everybody under, uh, underestimated even electricity at some point was like, no, it will be bad, uh, people will die and stuff like that. So you have always this, this thought, uh, is, this, is this actually compared? Because I only know it from history books. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a, a very good uh, comment there because going back in time, um, and again, uh, I can remember with the old rotary telephone, uh, and just to share with you um, somewhat ancient history, those old telephones had what was called a party line, meaning that Trey and I would have been on the same line, and that if Trey wanted to talk to someone, I could listen in, but I couldn't talk. So, and I look at how this technology has changed over the last 60 years, especially in the 21st century. It's just mind-boggling how fast this technology has changed. And of course, I look back to the people who say, you know, hey, it's not going to work. You know, I don't like this. I don't like that. I'm a farm boy, grew up on the farm, and I can remember how my grandfather, what have you, they still used the horse because in their mind, that was the most reliable uh, machine on the farm. But now you have tractors that are being guided by GPS. So that clearly shows how this technology has changed the way we live and it's changed the way we will live. And for those people who just refuse to turn the 20th century loose, um, I'm sorry for you. Because it's not, if we would say you're not going to put this cat back in the bag, not now. Definitely. I already can say that your podcast together, the two of you will be really uh, popular. I feel like uh, you you make a great, uh, <laughs> great. Um, I'm not an English speaker, so the only word that I have now is couple, but there's probably a better one for, for two. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Tag team. We're, we're, tag we're, team. we're a great couple. <laughs> <laughs> no, couple, we, tag team. Yeah. I, so I call him, I call him tax man. Right. Like I've, I've, I've yeah. known him for 12 years and yeah. it's been about 12 years now. And, and ever since my introduction to him, I've just called him, Hey, tax man. And I would go get my taxes done by him and I would pay him in dollars and pie. Right. I'd give him some pies. Um, and our relationship just grew over time. And then one day uh, I was, I had just gotten my, I think it was my second job in crypto. We were talking about crypto while I was doing, while we were, I think selling taxes for the year. Right. And then like, it became like this back and forth tit for tat over a number of months where I, we would talk about it a little bit over the phone or we'd run into each other and then he would disappear. Like I wouldn't hear from him for a couple of weeks and then he would come back with new questions and then he would disappear and then he'd come back with new questions. 
And then when we got to mining, when we got to talking about how like mining operations work in Bitcoin, uh, his initial response was very like, oh, that's that's very interesting. I, I didn't know that it worked that way. Or like, how does this, you know, he was very interested. And then a couple of days later, he calls me and the first words out of his mouth, I was like, hello. And he was like, I want to mine, baby. I want to mine. <laughs> and so so we got together and that kind of that's when the door really opened for both of us to working together towards Bitcoin was we started working together, planning to figure out or figuring out how to plan a mining operation. And through like a weird series of events, we ended up meeting some young guys who had recently bought a tobacco facility nearby. And in North Carolina, we're kind of like the tobacco capital of the United States, or at least to my knowledge, we are. And the tobacco facility that we ended up at is a big industrial facility that used to produce like a lot of cigarettes. First buildings were built in like the 1890s. It was very early, very early place. But it was, it was almost like a, a really unique experience because for the, when we first when we first really talked to the owners about mining Bitcoin taxman, we, we started talking together and taxman said that my grandfather used to deliver taco, tobacco to this facility when he farmed tobacco and correct me if I'm wrong on anything here, taxman, but if I remember correctly, you were effectively saying that that facility was part of what put food on the table for you oh, guys yes. when you were kids. Yes. And so fast forward 40 years, 50 years, and here we are mining Bitcoin in the exact same facility. And, we, you know, I, we get, we've, we've been lucky enough to really tour the facility. We know the owners really well. Um, and our miners have been running there now for roughly two ish years, give mm -hmm. or take roughly two years. Um, and so we've learned a lot about Bitcoin through that process. We've learned a lot about energy. Uh, we've really expanded, I think everyone's knowledge in our general sphere on technology and Bitcoin. And as we progressed, we realized that the more and more people we talked to that, even though we thought, Bitcoin was the greatest thing since sliced bread and we were all hyped up about it. And we thought everybody else would kind of feel the same. We ran into a lot of roadblocks and a lot of like negativity from people. And I'm sure that you do even now with the point of sale at your place, I'm sure mm -hmm. you run into people. So when we started the podcast, the idea was that our community is getting left behind, right? Bitcoin conferences, if you go to one and I haven't been to a Bitcoin only conference, but I've been to a couple of crypto conferences and what it always seems like is it's one Bitcoiner for the sake of argument, let's just say Bitcoiner. It's one Bitcoiner talking to another Bitcoiner about how awesome Bitcoin is and how they can get together to make some more Bitcoin. That's kind of what these conferences become. Whereas when I walk out on the street dressed like George Washington, holding a sign that says, you know, there is no red, there is no blue, there is the state and there is you, you know, Bitcoin is your, your escape route. I get laughed at, you know, I get, I get heckled. I get, I get negative feedback. I get occasional positive comments. And so our podcast became, we're going to take the fight directly to our community. We're going to sit down with our community leaders, with our with our school systems, with anyone who will talk to us from blue collar worker guys to moms to, the, you know, like teachers, anybody, because they all need to understand. And because of their proximity to Bitcoin isn't that close. They're not in the IT field. They're not in the cryptocurrency field. They only get what the news tells them. And that's not enough for them to jump ship and join Bitcoin. Somebody has to sit down with them and be like, you know why teachers don't get paid enough? It's because the goal isn't. The, the goal isn't to educate students. The goal is to make money. And that's why you see corruption at school boards and you see corruption at, you know, all these different levels within the school system. So how about we just talk to the, the, the school system and be like, look, you can say what you want, but the numbers don't lie, right? We can throw millions of dollars of, of revenue at you every year and nothing gets better. So either you suck and you're terrible or your money sucks and your money's terrible. And because I don't believe that you're like our school board or anybody like that in our community is innately bad. They're just working in the system that they're working in. So it's like, look at this other system. Let us help you. Let's mine Bitcoin at school. Let's put a miner in there and let the kids learn how to mine Bitcoin in eighth, ninth, 10th grade. Let's let them start thinking about energy. And all these things come together on our podcast when we sit down and talk about uh, this exact thing with our community. So uh, my relationship with Tom has developed from, hey, I have a question about Bitcoin to a podcast and a mining operation where we're trying to get everybody to invest in Bitcoin and everybody to join us. So it's a weird thing, but it's been a real fun ride. And the other thing for me, again, have been in taxes and accounting and bookkeeping and economics and the whole concept of business is also the whole blockchain technology there. In fact, I think I first read about the blockchain technology, you know, again, going back to the farm, the agricultural world, <coughs> that it was being used to track animals from a farm. 
And I was like, wow, this is pretty amazing. Yeah, so of course, when I got to talking to Trey and he began to share with me the concept of Bitcoin in mining, I began to connect the dots of the whole blockchain technology. And, and again, this technology is not going away. And that's what in the message that I have for small businesses, because I'm really big on small businesses, entrepreneurship. Look, if you want to go in business for yourself, you want to control your destiny, you got to control your money. And right now, you can't control your money because it's controlled by the politicians and the bureaucrats and the central banking network that's there. But if you want to be in control of your destiny, if you want to ensure that what you are doing, that you're going to achieve your dreams, you need to look at Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I love it so much. Um, Bitcoin mining is also a really interesting thing that you're doing because I feel like it's becoming a more more specialized industry. Where you have to have like equipment and you have to like when you zoom back like 10 15 years uh it, it's okay if you have just a laptop and you can mine a few bitcoins a day now you have to really have a big farm and you have to have specialized equipment would you still recommend regular people that maybe have a solar roof or something like that uh to to mine bitcoin or even someone that has just an apartment that wants to mine bitcoin is is that still is, is that something that you would recommend or more like, ah, oh, just put it in Bitcoin and don't worry about mining? I mean, I think, every, I think it's easier to get Bitcoin if you just buy it, but you're missing out on a lot. Like if, you, if your goal is to accumulate as much Bitcoin as possible, as fast as possible, then and you have the resources to do it, just buy it. But if you're talking about the average everyday person, what Bitcoin mining teaches you is actually how Bitcoin kind of works because you have... You have the mining operation itself. So you need to understand a little bit about uh, what what's going on, right? You have payouts. So you need to understand a little bit about wallets and where that money goes. You have uh, electrical costs. So you start to really understand what your area's electrical costs are and where you can find cheaper electricity, which then eventually leads you to understanding energy, which has really been one of the outside of Bitcoin, understanding energy has probably been one of the bigger breakthroughs that I've had personally. Um, so and it's KYC, potentially KYC free Bitcoin, uh, depending on, you know, how you operate. So yes, you can get more if you just outright buy it and it's faster and it's probably better for anybody who's just looking to get started, but you could, you, there's so many gotchas with that. Cause you could just buy Bitcoin, leave it on exchange. That exchange goes down. Something happens to that exchange. And now you hate Bitcoin because you lost your money. Whereas Bitcoin mining, you can kind of do the same thing by leaving your, your Bitcoin in the pool, but for the most part, if you're mining, you're already at the point where you're starting to understand wallets and the general idea of Bitcoin's location and, and its relationship to you. Uh, my, mining is, that's why I think schools should do it because it's a fun, it's fundamental energy. It's fundamental, uh, it's fundamental educational energy. It's fundamental educational Bitcoin. It's fundamental education on IT because you hit the network. You have potential problems with firewalls. You have potential problems with, um, you know, all kinds of IT related things. You have problems with heating. It teaches you so much that it's unbelievable. Like me two years ago, before I ever touched an ASIC or a Bitcoin miner, I knew, a, I knew enough about Bitcoin to be, uh, to say I could survive in a Bitcoin environment if I had to. I, I knew how to transact. I knew the basic fundamentals. I knew how to check price. I knew, how, I knew what a SAT was. But once I got into mining, it just exploded. And my knowledge just started ramping up at, at probably one of the fastest pace as far as me learning something new. It's probably one of the fastest things I ever learned was because turn on the miner. Oh, now it's hot. Now I have to learn heat management like immediately, not tomorrow, but like at this moment. Um, we have eight immersion miners. So we have eight miners that are in an immersion tank. So then that became, now I need to learn how to be in a, be a plumber. Basically, I need to understand how pumps work. Then, you know, talking to kind of your regular Joe electricians, uh, they don't necessarily know what you know type of requirements you have should you have a 20 amp breaker or a 30 amp breaker on each machine you know all the like what's a pdu uh, you know where do those come from how many pdus can fit on there what size breakers on the pdu I, all these things come up when you start mining bitcoin so yeah i think everybody should mine it i think you should have a miner at home i got one right behind me i think you should i think you should mine as much as damn possible really I love and it. in the uh, process, as you imagine, you learn the concept of doing business. 
Because as Trey just mentioned, you've got to incorporate all these other moving parts to make this thing work. Well, if you want to go in business, you got to understand there's a lot of moving parts to being in business. You got to understand the cost. You got to understand what to sell that product for and what have you. But the thing about Bitcoin is that once you have mined the Bitcoin, the market dictates the value. And so, of course, it's tied directly to supply and demand. And we all know the supply is getting smaller and smaller, but the demand is going to continue to grow. And those are the basic building blocks of being in business for yourself. You can have the greatest ideas in the world, but if the market is flooded, nobody's going to want to buy it. But if you got a product where the supply is beginning to decrease, decrease basically every day and demand continue to increase, how are you going to lose money? If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing how to buy bitcoin it's simple have a bitcoin only exchange don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that be on a bitcoin only exchange i use 21 bitcoin 21 bitcoin is for me the best partner for that and now where do you store bitcoin bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet so that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. It's fascinating to see the mining industry. And for me, it's always just interesting to see uh, when I encounter people that don't research Bitcoin deeply, but they read some headlines. Uh, and then there's a lot of the energy fat going on around Bitcoin mining. Uh, and they really look on a really surface level of, of Bitcoin. Um, do you like when, whatever I like, when I see this newspaper and putting that, that headline out, like, oh, Bitcoin uses that much energy, like double that of Austria or something like that. I'm always thinking like, why are they making those news articles? Like, why, why are they not presenting also the other side? Like, why are they not giving like a whole picture on, on, on the thing and like presenting more of, of the stuff? Uh, where do you think like this 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 mining energy fund is coming from, and um, do do you see it as like now a little bit dampened? Like now it seems like less and less people talk about it, and less and less uh, it it comes up. But do you still see it as coming up, and do you still see it as something that you encounter with Bitcoin mining? It, it seems like it it comes and goes. Right? Sometimes there's a lot of FUD coming on about Bitcoin's energy consumptions. And then other times, you know, you'll get like a positive spin from a group that normally doesn't have a positive spin on Bitcoin due to some additional research they've done. But it, I think the root of it is that the media is one of them, like the pen is mightier than the sword type of deal. The media is one of the most powerful organizations on the planet, and it doesn't really matter which country or what media organization you're talking about. They can all be weaponized in the same way if they aren't yet it's likely a matter of time before any news organization is weaponized and the people that control the new news or news organizations are deeply rooted in the current financial system. It's an engine for producing money and through the, the way that they generally do it is just through views. And we all know that outrage typically gets more views like a cute story about a bunch of puppies is great, but run over that same group of puppies. And that's a much bigger story. Right. No, is, I mean, it just is right. I don't want to run over puppies. I like puppies. But I mean, generally speaking, if you were to do that and see which one gets the most views, it's the car. Um, 
that said, people don't understand energy. The fundamentally, they don't understand energy. I just got back from Texas and I got the opportunity to tour some sites in Texas. And I was in the energy, I don't know if it's the energy capital, but it's definitely a big oil and gas place in Texas. Um, and while I was there, you, you could tell that many miners that were there were running as efficiently as possible, close to the energy sources, utilizing renewables, uh, utilizing wasted energy. I mean, I'm so deep down the energy rabbit hole that we've, I mean, he's a, he's come, he comes from a farming background. So when I tell you this next thing, it might, you'll see the connection. We got the idea that look how much hog waste from, from swine or pigs in North Carolina there is. It's a major problem. We'll have like lagoons, they're called lagoons, filled with just hog waste. And it might be hundreds of thousands of gallons of hog waste sitting in an open lagoon, open to the air, polluting the ground, potentially causing issues in the community, so on and so forth. But what happens if I back up a shipping container and suck up all that waste and then use the methane off that waste to mine Bitcoin and then turn the rest into fertilizer? And I got so deep down this hole that right now in my backyard, there's a 55 gallon bucket filled with hog waste that I was trying to see how much methane I can get off 55 gallons and run a small generator as a proof of concept. Well, it turns out that it's hard to do that during the winter time unless you can heat the, the, the contents of the container, which I could do with a Bitcoin miner, but I just never made it that far. Now we're on kind of a different journey where we're exploring ideas like what happens if I open a tire shop off the side of the interstate, you know, and in North Carolina and say free tire disposal here. And I do standard tire work. You know, I change tires and sell tires and I change oil and sell oil and whatnot, but except I take all the tires that are either given to me because people need to get rid of them or that I take from customers that got tires changed and I put them through a process that turns them back into fuel. And then mine Bitcoin, I can, I can lower the cost of getting your tires and your oil changed. I can make tire recycling, from a customer standpoint, effectively free because I want your tires so you can come drop them off with me. So now I've got a business model that a tire shop can make money, an oil shop can make money. So I have a business that makes dollars in general, but on the backside, it uses the waste from that business to mine Bitcoin. And I only have a couple of miners, so it wouldn't take that many tires for me to pull this off operationally. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out and putting these things together. And that's where I'm always kind of at mentally is how do I take the miners that I have and put them on a, an energy source that's based on waste, either hog waste, tire waste, plastic waste, I mean, vegetable waste, you name it. And I'm probably trying to figure out how to do it because it's effectively free. People will just throw out food. They'll throw out waste. There's tires everywhere. If you associate like an economy to waste, then all of a sudden waste becomes valuable. People will bring you waste. I mean, you can, you can look at the copper, there's a problem in the United States right now where in certain communities, if you leave copper out, even to include the copper that's inside of your air conditioner, if it's not secure, people will come steal it. They'll come cut it straight out of your air conditioner because copper has value. So what do you, what do I think is going to happen is what happens if I, if I assign a value to scrap tires and I say, Hey, I'll pay you a dollar per, I don't know, hundred pounds of tires, which is be like three tires or four tires, right? I'll pay you a, a dollar per hundred pounds of tires or something. How many tires will show up until I find it like an equilibrium? Probably not many at first, but if you're running a business that collects tires as part of your business and you have to pay to get rid of them because the, the regular trash dump won't take them unless you pay, why wouldn't you bring them to me and let me pay you a dollar for a hundred pounds? You know, it, this concept of energy and how it ties together with Bitcoin really makes you wonder these things. And it kind of eats at you. You, sleep, you can't sleep at night because you're thinking about hog poop and tires. It's the craziest shit, right? And back to your question there as to uh, why is this negative news uh, to Bitcoin? Well, as you begin to understand money in the history of money, you begin to come to the conclusion is to keep you a slave. If I can keep you a slave and control your money, then you always gonna have to obey me and follow what I want. But if I take away those shackles and give you the freedom to control your life and control your financial reward, then you're not a slave anymore. And that's the thing, and people get all hung up about trying to define what is a slave and what have you. But the key thing about being a slave, you are dependent upon the master.
Well, if you're not dependent upon the master, then you control your own future and your own destiny. So you're actually in control of your life. And what do you hear everybody talking about? What I want to do with my life? You know, again, talking about my grandchildren and what have you. You know, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your life? Well, you want to control your life. You want to be productive with your life. You want to enhance your life as well as the people around you. Well, how can you do that if you are a slave to somebody else's money? But if you control your money, your destiny, then you're going to build a world. Yeah, that, that's, uh, this is one of the, f the first thing, first tweets I made like last year that went a little bit viral where I actually made the comparison between, uh, people in the fiat world and slaves. And I actually went like uh, through a lot of definitions of slaves. I went through the history of slave slavery. Uh, and I got to see a lot of similarities. Obviously there are difference, <laughs> but, uh, there are a lot of uh, similarities in there and it's, it, it, uh it's it's an interesting uh, intersection to go out do yeah i don't i don't really need to control your your person as much as i need to control your time if i want to control you if i can make you go to work because you have to earn money because you have to pay for things and i can simply devalue your money and make you work longer or more or harder and be able to buy less then i can control whatever i want i, I have a lot of friends in the second amendment community and their argument about Bitcoin typically is, well, what happens when they come and take it? You know, what happens when they come knock on your door and they're like, we're going to take this Bitcoin or we're going to, you know, arrest you and imprison you. Uh, and the, the, the answer is yet yeah, like you have a, a right to self-defense, but in the end they can only take it from you if you give it to them. And that's, that's the newest that that's never existed before. Like for the first time in human history, we can all united like as one human entity say against the powers that be we don't need you anymore you can't do this anymore because we have another option that you can't stop you can kill us you can kill a whole bunch of us but in the end the idea will live on and it will continue and it's the first time in human history we've ever been able to say that every other time was a select group of humans asking for a select group of rights from someone who just had to grant them those rights or grant them the freedom to execute those rights whereas now it's like i don't have to ask your permission anymore like this is the, this is a Magna Carta moment, but for the entire world, it's the first declaration of real independence from a, a state and money and financial control that's ever existed. Before this, even under the gold standard, they just come beat you to death and take it. And you can do that with Bitcoin. Sure, you can come and and rob me and try to get my you know my uh, my words or whatnot, my wallet. But you have to find it, and if you can't find it, or if it just simply doesn't exist except outside of my mind. I have to give it to you. Otherwise, there's nothing you can do about it. You can, people always complain about KYC Bitcoin and, and whether or not people know uh, what your Bitcoin address is, like the IRS or the government. They're going to know, right? This is the biggest deal since nuclear war. They're going to figure out who you are. It's not going to take them that long. The CIA is not like a friendly kind of half-assed dumb organization. They will figure out who you are. And so if you're not here for the fight, if you're not here for that knock on the door, uh, you're not fully in yet. I'm so deep in where it's like a Bitcoin goes down. Like, I'm not sure what to do with the rest of my life. Like, honestly, like, well, I don't know what, like, what other fight do I have? You know, like, I'm not going to go fight on behalf of my country anymore because my, my, my country is generally waging wars over dollars. I'm not going to go fight for the dollar anymore. Like, it's not a thing. And so I, I don't think in the long term that, it will matter. I think the United States and, and other entities will adopt Bitcoin because they have to. But for right now, to come back to where we started, it is a form of slavery to control someone's time, someone's money, because they simply can't escape. They can't go anywhere. And if you look at El Salvador, and I say El Salvador is the best example that you can have. Of course, the economy has turned around. But even more important, the people are not living as a slave to the criminals. Because, of course, the, the president, um, he had a pretty well of a blanket policy there. He locked up a lot of people and then took the criminals off the street. But even more important, why would I rob Trent when I can't get his information? It's nothing there. So he could have a million dollars in his pocket. You know, boom, hit him in the head, take the money. But he could have a million dollars in his wallet. And what good is the wallet if I can't get into it? And that's the big thing that took place in El Salvador is they took away the motive 
to commit harm and to steal and rob from people. It's a crazy thing. It, it's 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 giving uh, property rights back finally uh, right, to the individual, right. which means you're not a slave. See, if you're a slave, you can't own property. But if you own property, you're not a slave. <laughs> What what would that do to the power structures? Like we have all the 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 power structures, the governments, the CIA, the IRS, like in America now with the same thing happening in Europe, in China, there's a whole nother story. Uh, but what what will Bitcoin do in the long run? Do do those power structures uh, do you have like an imagination what, what can happen to them? Bend the knee. That's my that's my comment. Bend the bend the knee. Because you can't you can't argue with math and you can't game theory is real in my opinion you will always act in your own best interest and if your own best interest is to to maintain the current system you will try to do so but the moment your own best interests do not align with maintaining the current system it doesn't matter really who you are you will either convert or be converted right this is like a gunpowder moment china discovers gunpowder it wasn't up to the europeans to just not adopt gunpowder you either adopt it Or you don't. And either way, when in terms of, of, a, of, of being willing to work with a new technology, everyone was forced to bend the knee to gunpowder. Everyone was forced to bend the, we, the, bend the knee to the wheel, and everybody will be forced to bend the knee to Bitcoin. Because there, the other option is to continue to allow someone else to control you in the devaluation of your money. Most people just don't know it yet. Most like if you look at American rap music, right? Like you can take from, from the 1990s when I was coming up and, and listening to rap music in the 1990s album covers would have like nice Mercedes on them. Now, you know, like rappers are, are way richer than, than having a nice Mercedes. And there's twofold, right? Like you have inflation and, and, and the value of the dollar and things like that. You can simply get more money, but the, the transformation between we have something nice and to kind of what the current rap music scene is of it's just about money. It's only about money. There is no other thing. Most people are in that zone. They just think about money. They don't think about where it comes from, if it's good or it's bad. I'm getting ready to travel to Japan. And my kid last night was asking me how the yen works compared to the dollar and which one was better. Was the federal reserve in Okinawa or in Japan, the same as the federal reserve for us. And I had to explain to him or her all these different, aspects of why the yen is different than the dollar and why the dollar kind of backs the yen and how they're related and what just happened with the yen and the federal reserve, all these different things. But most people aren't even at that level of like my 17 year old kid. They're just not there. They're not thinking about it. And so the power structures, once people start to realize this, and it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when, once people start to realize this and gen it might be a generational change, it might be a multi-generational change, but the power structures They rely on our willing ob obedience. And once our willing obedience is removed because we have an alternative system that we control, then the power structure will have no choice. Either kill us or bend the knee. And you can kill us if you want to. You can, you can sit on a throne on top of hell, but it's still going to be hell. So make your choice. And also, it will put the powers to be out of business. It's a, it's yeah, a big I, thing. Yeah. Yeah, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, only, Bitcoin allows you to only pay taxes you agree with. <laughs> Which also is like the the common theme when I ask uh, Bitcoiners how they imagine a, the political system in the future on a Bitcoin standard. Uh, most tend to like, of course, um, if there is a service from a government uh, or there's a service from an individual thing that I want to pay for. For example, there's a uh, the road that I'll travel. I I'm I'm prepared to pay a fee because they have to maintain the road. Uh, I'm prepared to pay fees, but It should be optional, no, not like forced. Okay, yeah, I'm traveling on the road. I should pay for the for the road that I'm traveling on. It's, it's, it's normal. Just like when I go to a restaurant, they're making me food. Of course, I have to pay for that because they provided me value. I will provide them value back. Uh, so it will be really interesting to see. It probably will, will be a long, long fight and a long uh, revolution. But Bitcoin, and that's a fantastic thing, Bitcoin is the first revolution in history um, where when you take part in it, you actually get richer with it and you actually get uh, more resources over time because Bitcoin is the scarcest asset and it's the best money. Uh, and uh, in all the other revolutions, uh, at least that I know of, maybe you can correct me, um, when you took part of the revolution, 
you got maybe something in the end, more freedom usually, but the way towards it was really heavy, was really bad. You got away with your money. Like it's, it's, it was usually like a bad thing during the revolution. You have to be really hard in that. Bitcoin is like a, um, a revolution on steroids because you actually get rewarded for taking part in it, which is a fascinating uh, thing to think about. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm here for the fight. I, I didn't pick this fight because I wanted to fight, but once I understood what was going on, I, I'm 100% here for the fight. And because I'm, I'm not a public entity per se, right? I'm not like a big face in the world, but I will be, if I'm successful in, in any of my endeavors, I, I will be at least known. And if anybody's watching, they'll know who I am They'll likely know where I'm from and they can easily decide to come after me, whatever power that may be from a, you know, a, a person that I know that gets upset with something to the IRS or to the United States government. Like I'm not, it's not, I'm not going to be unknown, but that's the only way I can fight this fight. I don't know how to wear like a green suit and show up to conferences and talk about Bitcoin. I'm not that eloquent. What I am is a trailer park kid who's, who's, who's really just tired of watching people get shit on. And the, like think about how many single moms there are that are working one or two jobs. They're trying to get their kids to school that can't make ends meet. They're not going to survive. Like they're, they're not going to make it and their life isn't going to get better because their money isn't going to get better. Sure. They could get a better job. They could, they could do all these things to improve themselves, but statistically it's just unlikely. You typically kind of, you know, you kind of have a, you hope you have like a, a gradual, um, Let's call it a come up like you, you're doing better over time up until about your 30s and in your 30s you are kind of stuck wherever you're at unless you make some big moves. And now you're riding the road to retirement. And by the time you're in your 50s or 60s, most people are slowing down. They're not taking big risks. They're, they're not trying to move forward. They're comfortable or they're satisfied or they're at least accepting of whatever it is that they've done in their life. If you have a single mom who's 35 years old, who's raising two or three kids, who's working, you know, jobs that don't supply enough pay or benefits for her to have a good life. It's unlikely that it's going to get better in her forties or her fifties. Her time is, is not on her side, but if she owned Bitcoin, then it is likely that in her forties or fifties, that things will get better because she will have more resources to expend, to help her children, to help herself. So like that type of person can't, likely can't fight the fight that we're fighting. They can't be involved at this level because they don't have the knowledge or the resources. So if I show up in a green suit, like a, you know, like a crazy person, even more so than, than a, than a George Washington suit. But if I show up to a, in a green suit and start trying to fight this fight, I can get the word out there, but who's going to hear me? Other people who already know. If I want to fight this fight for the people in my community, they have to trust me and they have to see me. I have to be the face that they can come and punch when something goes wrong. And I have to be the face that the community can look to for help when some, when things are going right and they have questions. If I was afraid to fight this fight, which is not necessarily that I'm without fear, but if I wouldn't fight this fight, then I would watch my community go down while I came up. And that doesn't seem like a good situation for me. What seems like a better situation for me is to just get out there. My life's only so long. You know, if I die, at, if I die at 40, if I die at 75, the difference is only a few years from my perspective, but the impact that I have and the legacy that I live to my community is very important. I want them to be better after I'm gone. And it isn't just my kids. It's, it's everyone. So I got to put my face on. I got to walk out in public and look like George Washington. I've got to get yelled at by people. I've got to convince folks like Taxman on the, you know, on the, the merits of Bitcoin. I got to go get laughed at at the, you know, at the, the bowling alley. I got to get kind of not embarrassed, but I know that I'm in an uphill fight every time I go on the Golden Oldies, Oldies radio show because they believe in gold and the rest is over. Like you don't even need to have a conversation. It's gold or it's gold or nothing. It's gold or the dollar. It's really the only two options. So like, this is a fight and everyone to include me will bend the knee. And mm. to teach people that with the Bitcoin, you are actually protecting your labor. The greatest thing we have is our labor. That is our capital. Well, if you work and you enhance your earning potentials, what good is it if the more you earn, the more you tax and the more you is taken away from you. But if your labor, if your earning potential continue to increase, and as it increases, it gains value instead of losing value. 
Because the fact of it is now with the fiat currency, your labor loses value. What I did yesterday, that value has less today because of the inflation and what's taking place with the U.S. currency or, or the world currency for that matter there. So once people learn that this is a way to protect your labor and to protect what you have earned and not lose value, the light's going to come on and be like, hey, why haven't I been doing this all along? Yeah. Um, it's. It, it's so fascinating uh, to, to see, um, especially the, the passion that you two do it. Um, do, do you think uh, that that Bitcoin can coexist with fiat or is it like either Bitcoin or fiat uh, in the long run? Of course, like right now they are coexisting kind of, but in the, like the long run, when we're talking like 100, 200, 500 years, uh, will it come down to like it's it's the base layer of our financial system. Everybody uses Bitcoin in some sort of sense, of course, with layer technology, of course, with uh, companies on build on tab, of course, with even like banks could be built on top of Bitcoin. They take this custody because maybe not everybody wants to have self custody, which I'm a big fan of that. Everybody takes the self custody, but that's another discussion. But do you think like governments will always issue their own currencies? I think I think to a certain degree, they, they at least in the near term, let's say the next fifty to hundred years, they have to because the we can't just rip the complete financial system apart and say, okay, now it's Bitcoin. It would take us a long time to get to a point where everyday transactions, um, large transactions, business to business transactions, bank to bank transactions, before they could all come up to speed and actually do it. Bitcoin itself is capable. But it's the people that are going to take time, the processes, the technology that needs to be replaced or implemented at all these levels. So I think that in the short term, eventually, in the United States, the dollar gets backed by Bitcoin. And there's something that kind of similar to how it used to be backed by gold. But I don't think that's the long term thing. I think in the long term, Bitcoin just becomes the money. And everybody who it's almost like a global citizenry where everyone in the Bitcoin global citizenry transacts with, with Bitcoin. Um, maybe that's on a layer two or even a layer three version of Bitcoin, but fundamentally Bitcoin, whereas in, in the short term, I think there'll be a transition period where the dollar combats against Bitcoin and then the dollar is backed by Bitcoin or something like the dollar is backed by Bitcoin. And then we, we're going to have to fight the war against CBDCs at some point, I'm sure. But once we whip their ass and we move on, uh, I think Bitcoin becomes the, the end all be all money at some point. It just will be a transitional phase in between. Because at some point in time, <clears throat> Nothing lasts forever, of course. And with Bitcoin, until the internet goes kaput, the Bitcoin is going to be here. Well, even if the internet went away, which would be a really, you know, I mean, don't even worry about Bitcoin if the internet goes away. Yeah, just, just right, try to go, it's over. Yeah, just try to go grocery shopping or get some money out of your bank. Like, it doesn't really matter. The internet's down, so you're, you're hosed anyway. But, I mean, again, it'd be like if you outlawed V8 engines. And you took all the V8 engines away. Yeah. You, somebody's still going to create a new V8 engine. So from an internet perspective, you could still use mesh networks and other ways to work, even if the internet itself was down, because we know how to connect cables. When people own things like switches and routers, it wouldn't be ideal. It wouldn't be fast, but it wouldn't necessarily kill Bitcoin. It would simply slow it down. All right. It's, mm -hmm. You got a flat tire on the racetrack. Just put a new tire on, you'll be all right. Which is, an, which is a really interesting thought to think about, like what 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 happens, and and there's a like uh, I discussed I think like a half a podcast with uh, Guy Swan about what is the bigger revolution, the internet or Bitcoin, <laughs> which is which is um, an interesting thought. What's a, what are your thoughts on it? So Bitcoin or the internet, the bigger revolution. I think that the internet was the first informational revolution after the printing press. If you look at I mean, I, I think Bitcoiners talk about the printing press a lot, but if you look at what happened after the printing press, it wasn't just that people got smarter and religion spread. It became available, it, like people started to recognize that they could create knowledge and disseminate knowledge. And because they could write one book and then that book could be copied a thousand, you know, a thousand, 10,000 times. Whereas with the internet, when the internet came around, people initially started creating knowledge in the form of websites, but it wasn't necessarily new knowledge. It was knowledge that was already accumulated and that that knowledge just now needed to be packaged and put online. And of course, over time, we've learned new things and new knowledge has been distributed on the Internet and new people have access to that knowledge. But when you get to Bitcoin, this is this is it's the same as the printing press in the sense that before the printing press, knowledge 
in, was the was the valuable thing. Well, now knowledge is not necessarily all that valuable because it's it's not scarce anymore. Good knowledge or wisdom, I might say, is is valuable, but just reading headlines and knowing ten thousand headlines for the day isn't all that valuable necessarily. Bitcoin is a deeper level. It starts to solve a, a bigger problem than just you know, do you have the knowledge? It starts to solve a problem of how do you manage your time? And nobody says, you know what? I wish I just, if I, if I knew a little more tomorrow, you know, I'd have more time. But if you have more money, you can definitely say tomorrow I have more time because you can then remove yourself from work, right? You don't necessarily have to go to work and do those things. You can work for yourself or you can just use, use your resources. So I think Bitcoin's the bigger revolution. I think it's just the revolution at a deeper level. Yeah, and more widespread because, of course, with the printing press, it enabled the regular everyday working guy to have access to the information. Because up until then, it was pretty well controlled by church, the government, what have you, as to who got information, who didn't. Well, that's the thing about the Internet. You know, boom, you pull out your phone, you tap, 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 and the world is open to you. You know, who would have thought... 40 years ago, that we would be having a conference and had talking the way we are, and you're halfway around the world. Um, and I tell people, it reminds me of that old cartoon, The Jetsons, that where George Jefferson gets in his space machine and off he goes. And then he pulls up his video and boom, it's there. Well, that's where we are now. We're living in, again, in the 21st century where more and more people have access to information and Bitcoin is going to enable people to do more and more business worldwide. Mm, I love it so much. Um, I, I have probably like a thousand more questions to, to all of the Bitcoin topics and um, you're really fun to talk to. Um, but we're coming slowly to the end routine to the of the podcast which is also a fun one because this is the only question that comes from the previous guest like the Andrew is uh the previous guest asked a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is oh, that's uh good. and uh the your question uh is from the previous guest is you discover who satoshi nakamoto is he offers you ten thousand bitcoin to coop to keep his identity a secret do you take the bitcoin uh my initial reaction is no because like, uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't mind having 10,000 Bitcoins, but if I knew who Satoshi was and he offered me 10,000 or they offered me 10,000 Bitcoins to keep my mouth shut, I want to say that like the better part of me would be like, I'll keep my mouth shut anyway, because what you created is more important than my personal wealth. But at the same time, I'd probably say, yeah, give me the 10,000 Bitcoin and I'll, I'll still keep my mouth shut because 10,000 Bitcoin would be fantastic. Um, but no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to tell anybody either way. Well, I love a mystery. So, uh, and of course, 10,000 Bitcoin would be very, very tempting. Um, but uh, I agree with Trey. I would uh, not reveal who he is because of what has taken place. And again, that's what adds to the whole concept of Bitcoin. You know, it's kind of like that old, you know, who did it thing there and um i would say uh again i would sit on it as long as i could i would take it to my grave my my wife does a lot of genealogy research both in her own life like in her own genealogy and for friends and family and stuff that people are interested and she got latched on to satoshi when we first started getting into bitcoin she was like i don't think i'll figure it out she's like but i might look in areas that other people haven't and she did and she found some fairly interesting stuff about how finney I think it was about how Finney, at least. And uh, if this makes it to YouTube or this gets clipped or whatever, nobody quote me on this, you know, because I might have this wrong. I didn't actually do this research for myself. But there was something about uh, there was a relative of either Hal or another prominent early Bitcoin person that uh, prior to World War II, they lived in Hawaii. And in Hawaii at the time, there was a baseball team that they played on. And on that team was a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto. And it, the, the question was like, maybe if, if how was a, was actually Satoshi. Cause I, if you didn't know how is the first person to receive a Bitcoin transaction, I think from Satoshi, right? He was one of the very early Bitcoiners. He, he's done all manner of things for Bitcoin. Right. But if, if how was Satoshi, like in theory, then could it been a story from Hal's grandfather or somebody like that who fought in world war two, but just prior to that or during that 
was in Hawaii with on a baseball team with a guy named Satoshi Nakamoto. And maybe Satoshi and this guy's grandfather, Hal's grandfather, had a good friendship or they had a, you know, th there was some connection between them that was beyond baseball. And later in life, Hal remembered his granddaddy talking about this great guy, Satoshi Nakamoto, who might have done this thing. And so he adopted that name. Now, obviously, that's just absolute craziness. But when you start going down the genealogy route and looking at people, how they relate historically and then digging through newspapers and not looking at just Satoshi's writings or the writings of people that were around when Satoshi was first kind of public, you start to realize that you can actually start making a lot of connections between people and the name Satoshi Nakamoto if you just go back a generation or two. When there was a heavier, not a heavier, when there was a during World War II, when the Japanese and us weren't necessarily getting along, if you were Japanese on the mainland, mm -hmm. on the U.S. mainland or in Hawaii, you were subjugated to various things. And part of that subjugation was they would record your name. And so you start finding a lot of Satoshi Nakamoto stuff back during the era of World War II in the United States. It's a weird thing that my wife found there. Well, <laughs> she does a lot of it. She does like she does genealogy all the time. She'll just randomly be like oh i wonder where that person's from and then she'll just off to the races for a month it's uh, i in my beginnings when i discovered bitcoin i read about uh satoshi nakamoto his his might be uh, stories like there's a whole book about where I, who is satoshi nakamoto who could it be and there's so many different stories in there my takeaway was like there are too many great stories that uh it's almost impossible to figure out <laughs> the, the, the real one or maybe the real one is not even there and i feel like it's a great thing that satoshi nakamoto is not known yeah i, yeah. I do too it's the immaculate conception yeah, it, it adds to it yeah it's like the jesus story like if jesus was just a dude who like showed up in bethlehem at like the age of you know 20 and was like hey i got some stuff to tell y'all people probably wouldn't listen to him but because his story originates from a virgin birth and immaculate conception, people are like, hang on a second. Like, you don't have a daddy. You did what? Your daddy lives. Your daddy's a what? So when you talk about Bitcoin, you know, people say, I just in my last podcast, the guy was like, oh, Bitcoin was created in the United States and I'm very pro US. I was like, no, like, we don't know where it was created. The guy's name is Satoshi Nakamoto, but he used the British newspaper in the first block as a headline. Like, we don't know where he's from or, you know, if he was US, if he was born in uh, anywhere that, you know, we've even referenced. But the fact that we don't know that is that immaculate conception story. It's a similar storyline to Jesus. It adds to the ride. Yeah, it makes a, it's a mystery. Amazing. I love the podcast with two, the two of you. Um, where can people, when they want to listen to you, or ask you questions or get in touch with you, where can people find you? So we have the uh, podcast. That we've done four episodes. Uh, we're planning the next couple. The first three were really us learning. The last one was also a learning experience, but uh, it was our first politician. So that that had kind of a double edged sword where we were interviewing a politician for the first time and we were still working on sound and things like that. But we can find Bitcoin is dead. The podcast on every podcast platform for the most part, Apple, Spotify, YouTube, what have you. Um, otherwise, if you go, if you find us on Twitter, uh, BTC is dead. Uh, BTC is dead pod. If you find us on Twitter, there's a link to our discord where the only thing I promise in my discord is that I'll give you the honest answer. If you ask me a question, I don't promise it's the right answer, right? I've got, I'm sure that on a technical front, uh, there are many, many people who are better than me, but I'll do my best to answer your question with honesty. And, uh, we can just chat, you know, about Bitcoin or whatever in the discord server if you want. So discord, Twitter. Perfect. Then, uh, Tom Dre, it was a pleasure having you on. Thank you for your time and, uh, for everyone watching and listening, I'll be back tomorrow. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks.